Okay, thank you everyone, and good morning. Um, thank you so much to my hosts, uh, Helen, Andreas, Leif, and to my chair, Julianne. Um, it is definitely refreshing to attend a conference at which um, the quote-unquote goodwill of big tech companies is not at play, so it's nice to see that this is a space of independent and critical scholarship, and that feels really right, because that is certainly not the case for other conferences that cover issues of data, privacy, and surveillance. Um, I also want to thank my family uh, for letting me leave and attend this conference, um, as well as my collaborators, Mariela Saba, Tamika Lewis, Tawana Petty, and Kim M. Reynolds, of our data bodies. I'll introduce them a bit later on. Um, I finally just want to quickly dedicate this talk to Daryl, Daryl Fields, um, as well as to all of the individuals that uh, me and my collaborators have spoken with over the years throughout the course of our data bodies. Um, Daryl Fields, Daryl shared his real name with us in the course of interviews, um, was an unhoused individual living on Skid Row in Los Angeles. And he spoke to our data bodies about his struggles and his hopes. Daryl lived in poverty, um, but as this quote demonstrates, he talked about endurance and compassion, and he found strength in humanity. Just last month, Daryl died on Skid Row um, after somebody set fire to his tent while he was inside. And Daryl, you and other, others like you, your lives are beautiful and your stories are not in vain. Um, they're part of a larger transformative moment uh, that puts assumptions about the inevit inevitability of an unjust and unequal society to the test. In that spirit, my broad goal for this talk is to renew a sense of possibility for just and democratic futures in today's datafied society using healthy doses of reflexivity and pragmatism. That is, I want to talk about the process or processes by which people and institutions, predominantly in the United States, do and should confront and respond to systematic forms of oppression, i.e. problems, arising from data-driven systems, or more specifically, statistical and automated decision systems. This is a talk about governance and political power. And I consider a family of governance strategies that have been emanating from spaces of critique, including this space here, um, and a try to assess their totality. The impetus for this reflection is twofold. First, ever since doing a postdoc in the law school at Yale, and then working at a think tank job in Washington, DC, I've been struck by the narrowly individualistic approach to privacy and data protection that typically encompasses conversations about data-driven systems. And I've been struck by the profound inattention by policymakers and industry representatives to the unique experiences of members of marginalized groups vis-a-vis -vis data-driven technologies. On the other hand, I've also been struck by the inadequacy of the law and democratic procedures to meet the needs of the marginalized. Second, and here's where that dose of pragmatism appears, I'm struck that by the fact that many attempts to challenge the narrowness of dominant legal and ethical strategies can fall short of their professed radicalism. So this talk partly responds to this too. And it grapples with what Cornell West called prophetic pragmatism. As he explained, 
prophetic pragmatism, quote, attempts to keep alive the sense of alternative ways of life and struggle based on the best of the past. In this sense, the praxis of prophetic pragmatism is tragic action with revolutionary intent, usually reformist consequences and always visionary outlook, end quote. Overall, I want to add to existing conversations that critique mainstream approaches to governance of statistical and automated decision systems, but do so reflexively with the hope of setting out a path for changing existing status quo preserving governance strategies. Doing so requires me not only to compare between governance strategies, including what we might classify as alternative governance strategies, but also address political power. So I'll try and do this in five parts. Um, I'll spend a good amount of time talking about the, our data bodies project um, through the concepts of refusal and the idea of human-centered society, not AI first, but human-centered society. I'll introduce um, a debate on exempl exemplarity and the power and politics of exemplarity. Um, I'll talk about refusal as a strategy of governance. And in the fourth section, I'll relate this to alternative strategies and sort of compare them. And in the last um, section of this talk, think about friction and alignment in the totality of governance strategies. So you've heard just a tiny bit about our data bodies. Um, we're a five-person team. We are community organizers first and researchers second. Mariela Saba at the top is connected to the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Um, Kim M. Reynolds is a student organizer based in Cape Town. There's me. Um, Tawana Petty is based in Detroit and is with the Detroit Community Technology Project. And Tamika Lewis, um, at the time that we started um, our data bodies, is based with the Center for Community Transitions, which is a nearly 35-year-old organization dealing with the reentry of citizens from prison to society. Our research has been fundamentally collaborative and participatory. We imagine ourselves as allied with other movements in the struggle for social justice. Um, we're based in Charlotte, that's where Tamika is, Detroit, as I mentioned, Tawana, and Los Angeles, where Mariela is based. And between late 2016, up until the end of last year, we completed nearly 140 interviews with individuals in these city's most marginalized neighborhoods. We, just to clarify, we have been talking about data collection and data-driven systems with them across domains or contexts, right? This is both government data-driven systems and commercial data-driven systems. We've also completed three reflective focus groups in which we try and understand the ways in which we're analyzing our data, our material that people have shared with, people, with us, um, and as well held more than a dozen participatory workshops that allowed us to effectively understand how best to talk about all things data. That is, how best to talk about thing, all things data without stoking fear, creating paranoia, or, I think importantly, putting words in people's mouths. These cities differ in size and have unique histories. And we entered each community from a different starting context. As I alluded to in Charlotte, we were interested in reentry, citizens returning from prison, and employment. In Detroit, the context was utility shutoffs, evictions, and foreclosures. And in Los Angeles, we were 
talking or entering the conversation around housing and the intersection with criminal justice. In each of these cities, we've heard about systematic hardship. People talked, for example, of being caught in a cycle of disadvantage. After leaving jail, you can only find a temporary residence. When you go to apply for a job, you're denied that job after, for example, you list your criminal background or fill in an address that would indicate that you're living at a temporary shelter. So you get stuck in a rut. Or if you get lucky and are able to land work, your luck goes only so far. As Jill, a charlatine, explained, I pled guilty to worthless checks in 2003. That's almost 15 years ago, but it's still being held against me. Basically, all of my jobs have been temporary positions or contract positions. I'm going to continue. Um, but at the same time that we heard about systematic hardship, we also heard about refusal. People we talked to refused to settle for the data-driven systems or processes of data collection that were handed to them. These forms of refusal are agentic acts. And three stand out in particular, and I want to review them here. The first is a type of refusal that involves rectification. In the work that I've done, in the work that we've done with our data bodies, we've been examining the story of Mello. Uh, we're missing some. The image did not translate. It should say rectification. <laughs> so we've been examining the story of Mello, an older black woman who is unhoused and living in Skid Row in Los Angeles. And we interviewed her after her long struggle to get housed through the coordinated entry system, a system that functions as a sort of match.com for nearly 50,000 strong, uh, 50, strong homeless population in Los Angeles. Coordinated entry is powered by a scoring system called the Vulnerability Index, which is generated through a survey that welfare administrators pose to prospective housing recipients. Virginia Eubanks um, has also written about this, and I'll just acknowledge Virginia. Virginia was involved with our data bodies from 2015 to 2018. A resident of Los Angeles for 10 years and unhoused for four, Mello fought tooth and nail to be placed in housing. And she credits her doggedness as the reason for her success. Despite being an at-risk individual who should have scored high on the vulnerability index, she felt she was being denied housing because she was outspoken. She was outspoken against the conditions under which unhoused individuals live and exist on Skid Row. She discovered, for example, fraudulent shelter managers who demanded residents pay for shelter when shelters were already receiving benefits from the city. She saw security guards sexually harassing shelter residents. She heard shelter workers telling her to eat rotting food and sleep in bed bug infested beds. Mello even witnessed the death of a friend whose diabetic condition went overlooked and she died in a shower. Each time Mello could reapply for housing through the coordinated entry system, she was met with denial and told, your name has red tape on it. But just as she was dogged in documenting and reporting abuse at shelters, she was dogged in documenting her own needs for housing and for appealing. She refused to accept the terms and conditions 
of a data-driven system, the coordinated entry system, that the city tried to present to her. Eventually, she rectified her record and was granted, granted housing. And as she says here, the grievances were not in the file. And I had seven, at least. Good thing I made copies of my own. I took pictures of it. Any time before I turned it in, I took pictures of it. So I have so much footage that I have to go through. But everything should be in your file, grievances and all. This slide should say obfuscation. <laughs> so Mello's story of refusal is one of individual resistance. And similarly, Ken's story chronicles what individuals are doing every day to deny people and institutions who manage and implement data-driven systems the ability to control and manipulate them. But unlike Mello, who sought to accurately represent herself, and who literally said, machines didn't deny me. It was the people that was running the information that denied me. Ken's act of refusal rides on actively misrepresenting himself. Misrepresentation is, for Ken, a way to assert himself, to assert his personhood in the context of discriminatory state action. When Ken spoke to our data bodies, he explained his long history of struggle. A Native American man, he felt like most people around him targeted him, just as the United States government had targeted indigenous people since the 19th century, always wanted for dead. He struggled with mental health, drugs, and alcohol, was kicked out of shelters and had to live on the streets, where law enforcement routinely harassed and abused him. In one instance, while Ken was sitting down in front of some out-of-order public toilets, the local police showed up and tried to arrest Ken for trespassing. Ken countered back with the claim that the cops were harassing him for no good reason. When the police asked him his name, he gave them a false one prompting the cop to respond. Well, it's not in the computer. After several back and forths, the police issued him a ticket without a surname. And as soon as they left, he tore it up. And here's what he actually, the, the full extent of what he recounted in the interview, he says, in the context of being harassed by the police. Then they said, what's your name? I go, Ken Silvio. Ken Silvis? And I go, yeah, Ken Silvis. Then he goes, well, it's not in the computer. Then he said, it's still not showing up. They finally go, OK, we're going to give you a ticket. And again, he just tore it up afterwards. Clearly, Ken was practicing technological refusal. Like Mello, he refused to accept the terms of conditions that the police database presented to him. But in this case, he obfuscated his identity to remain excluded. And he did so in order to protect himself against a carceral technological system that he explained basically wanted him for dead. So far, I've described two individual level examples of refusal. They show people working against and within data-driven systems to get their dignity and get their due. But there's also refusal at the level of organized populations or communities. In Detroit, Tawana Petty, whose home organization, again, is Detroit Community Technology Project, has been leading efforts to claw back the city's plans to rapidly roll out cameras with facial recognition tech capabilities. Called Project Greenlight, the program has promised real-time crime fighting. And as of this summer, the city boasted of partnerships with 550 institutions, including schools, churches, health centers, and gas stations that would install these cameras 
and stream images back to police headquarters. Petty has been working with allied community organizations, tech privacy groups, and policymakers throughout the city and showing up to agitate at police commission meetings. She's marshaled the stories and insights from our interviewees, stating that they desire safety and belonging, not surveillance and a pretense of security. And thus far, Detroit Community Technology Project and others have met with some success. Project Greenlight is on hold while the commission reviews its original plans for real-time monitoring and a Michigan State Senator from, De from Detroit, Senator Isaac Robinson, has proposed a five-year ban, a five-year moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology. As with other cities in the United States, such as San Francisco and Oakland, banning facial recognition technology is a real possibility on the horizon. And as with other abolitionist efforts, like the stoppage of the use of predictive policing, such as we saw in Los Angeles, which was spearheaded by the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, another or anchor organization involved with our data bodies, it's a real possibility that Project Greenlight will go down in history. Whether it's refusal as rectification, refusal as obfuscation, or refusal as abolition, it's important to recognize that it's people's experiences, people's lived experiences, that are at the core of justification for how to govern data-driven technologies. What we heard behind all of these stories was the desire for a human-centered society. People wanted ac access to resources to live. As Terence says, either give motherfuckers a living wage or create conditions where we don't need capital and capitalism. People wanted to be recognized as a human being, not quantified. As Braxton said, you can't just put a stamp on a person at some point in time and expect that stamp to carry on forever. People wanted to be treated with respect or mutual recognition. As Jean said, talking about welfare administrators, they act as if they're doing me a favor. They treat me like I'm poor. People desired meaningful human relationships. As Ian said, I wanted to be real. I want to be real and relate to people. And importantly, people wanted to be able to love themselves for who they are. As Marco said, it's important for us to also take stock and to recognize that even if we are the poorest and the least protected, even if we have made the worst mistakes, we have the right to love ourselves because we also have to. We have to keep our spirits up. Now, some of this thinking about resources, recognition, respect, love, and friendship should be familiar to those of you that have explored contemporary theories of justice. And certainly what I'm trying to convey here ties to what Axel Hanif, Nancy Fraser, Iris Marion Young, Alessandro Ferrara, and Lois McNay have been writing about with respect to emancipation, agency, and equality. But this is the part of the talk where I have to pause. It's a part of the talk where reflexivity and pragmatism set in. And I'm imagining that some portion of the audience is thinking, sign me up. I'm ready to take some of these data-driven systems down, right? Let's go. And then I'm imagining that another portion is thinking, OK, sure. These are marginalized people, and this is what they experience. So 
Let's get back to our current debates on legal and ethical implications of artificial intelligence and AI systems. Don't worry, I won't let my imagination run too wild. And for me, that raises a series of questions. How are we to place these stories of struggle? What are we to make of these strategies of refusal? Simply put, are they too particular? Or should we just fit them into existing legal or ethical frameworks and ways of understanding, for example, data privacy or even inferential privacy? These questions have led me to explore a recently, uh, a relatively recent exchange between critical theorists Lois McNay and Alessandra Ferrara on the topic of exemplarity and political reasoning. Exemplarity refers to the bringing forth of hidden lived experiences, and it's thought to be central to re revealing structural domination as well as paths to emancipation. Exemplarity is essential to Ferrara's writings, and I should add, his attempt to resuscitate political liberalism and advocate for its appropriateness for complex democratic societies. He suggests, and you can make whatever you wish of that, um, he suggests that when something serves as an exemplar, it results from a particular and exceptional concatenation of facts and norms. Exemplarity, he argued in 2017, is what it is as it should be. It's what can help people to rec recognize commonalities among others. In a Kantian tradition, it motivates a sort of reflective judgment and brings us over the bridge from context boundedness to context transcendence. With respect to marginality and data-driven technologies and to processes of marginalizing surveillance, an application of Ferrer's understanding of exemplarity would be something like, if it can happen to marginalized people, it can happen to you. Or, it could happen to any of us. Or, all that abuse and misfortune that comes with flawed data collection processes and flawed data-driven systems, all of that that happens to marginalized people, it's coming for us. But is it? Is that universalizing of struggle the main value of revealing these stories and insights. As McNay argues, it's important to confront and sit with whatever discomfort or unfamiliarity such vivid disclosures of suffering reveal. Following on post-colonial theories, she critiques Ferrara's inclination to be universalists and says doing so, quote unquote, naturalizes normative consensus and neutralizes political conflict. To think of how everyone is affected by a particular example reduces the example of its political power and its potential to reveal a path or paths of change. To be sure, neutralization of the struggle of marginalized people in the context of a datafied society seems highly likely, with mainstream governance strategies of privacy and data protection on the one hand, and of fairness, accountability, and transparency on the other. In fundamental terms, privacy and data protection appeals to the universal. Everyone not specific groups, should have privacy rights. And if we extend the particularity of the struggle and suffering of marginalized people to the transcendent context of everyone, all of this bad stuff could happen to me, could happen to us, just like it happens to marginalized people, then it seems perfectly reasonable to arrive at privacy and data protection, 
as a response. In the United States, the demand for general privacy laws, such as, Calif as the California Consumer Privacy Act, is high. There are currently 11 federal privacy bills under consideration, and several more at the state level. While Americans are low to make comparisons to Europe's general data protection regulation, there is certainly a sense of urgency driving lawmakers' momentum behind reforming generalist or universalist privacy laws. Post-Cambridge Analytica, these laws create procedures that anyone can use. And any data subject could request from data controllers, for example, the names of third-party entities which a tech company shares um, sensitive information with. Reformed privacy laws would also help data subjects contest and rectify information by a data controller or processor. But McNay's musings on discomfort, conflict, and the power of exemplarity would suggest that we look for fissures in this universal offering. Fortunately, there are a few legal scholars or information law scholars who provide leadership in this area. Rebecca Wexler, for example, has begun to examine the kinds of notice and access exceptions that are built into mainstream privacy laws and that would continue under proposed laws. These exceptions allow companies to deny requests from data subjects in the context of criminal investigations, creating disparities of access to information between, for example, a person defending himself or the um, defense team and law enforcement for whom such requests would be granted. So there is an asymmetry here that exists within the universalist framework of data protection. The same could be argued in relation to recent attempts to institutionalize fairness, accountability, and transparency frameworks, especially from a self-regulatory or professional ethical approach. If data-driven systems are both actually and potentially harmful, why not just cut to the chase, tweak automated decision systems or decision models, and mitigate controversy and mitigate harm? This appears to be, be behind, it, this appears to be the logic behind maximalize, maximalizing models, an image of which is represented here and which comes from the work of Liu et al. at Berkeley's Artificial Intelligence Research Center. Here, the authors move quickly from, qu move quickly to context transcendence, saying, that while harm to me marginalized members of uh, to members of marginalized groups is of interest, what matters is a long-term consideration of social welfare. Using the context of lending and using the context of credit scoring to calculate loan worthiness, the authors look to accrue optimal benefits to lenders and borrowers. And you can see they have named this majority part of the curve the altruistic optimum. But McNay's critique, again, would have us pause before making that jump to context transcendence. Why should we assume that long-term social welfare means equilibrium between lenders and borrowers? Might there be something else going on, an underlying force of domination and oppression, for example? In total, McNay's view of power and the politics of exemplarity seems to stress an openness and a contextual sensitivity that universalist approaches tend to avoid. In this sense, we can understand refusal as a governance strategy from below, from the lived experience of the marginalized. And it absolutely sits uncomfortably with other forms of data governance. 
refusal functions as a form of cultural protest and civil disobedience, spanning individual and group level contexts. It means being unwilling to accept inaccurate or mischaracterized represent representations or bad data, which may mean rectifying one's datafied representation on the one hand, or supplanting the datafied self, a self of quantified behaviors, with, for example, a narrative self, a self created by voice or one's expressions that the individual narrates on the other. At the collective level, refusal as governance means abolishing particular technologies, interve intervening and stopping their deployment or development. So refusal's justification relies on both a priori and a posteriori considerations. Data-driven systems may or may not have harmed a marginalized individual or group with which she affiliates. What matters and motivates refusal is a highly situated power dynamic that has stifled the ability of individuals and groups to set the terms of their engagement with data-driven systems and with technology more broadly. Even within the family of alternative governance strategies, governance models that attempt to challenge the hegemony of privacy and fairness frameworks, it's easy to see where lived experience of marginality may not matter or matter directly. So let me just review some of these here um, before moving to the last section. So here I've listed six types of alternative governance strategies. There are many more that exist. I have not been able to include the totality of them. Um, but needless to say, marginality is not necessarily at the center of all of these strategies or the importance of disclosing suffering and, dis and struggle is certainly not at the center of each of these strategies. So let me just take each in turn. Introducing randomness or heterophily. This is an argument put forth by Wendy Chun. And she's talking about a particular context. She's talking about data-driven systems uh, with respect to social platforms. And she's calling for ways to find difference not similarity in networked environments. Distinct from other critiques of homophily, Chun states that the solution to the problem of homophily and the reality it constructs, i.e. it puts in place the world as it discovers, is to recognize the past from which the study of homophily originates. For example, spatial or racial segreg segregation. Second, she proposes that we recognize that homophily naturalizes discrimination. And third, we should actively explore, if not embrace and instantiate heterophily. Borrowing from Sara Ahmed, Chun states that an embrace of cultural difference is fundamental to living with socio-technical systems. And furthermore, instantiating randomness, i.e embracing heterophily can be generative. She advocates, for example, for search engines that shed light on diverse options rather than popular ones. In general, she's sign signaling a belief that conflict can help people to tolerate differences or at least identify ways <coughs> in which, or at least identify ways to live with mutual indifference. Now, you could argue for randomness <clears throat> and heterophily without focusing on disclosure of the lives and lived experience of members of marginalized populations. It's a solution that benefits or 
centers the importance of designers and developers. And I think that's very different from the type of centering with marginalized people that takes place under refusal as governance. Now, if we take the second alternative governance strategy, it refers to instantiating intersectionality. So there's a burgeoning space within computer science that focuses on instantiating Kimberly Crenshaw's idea of intersectionality. The most well-known of these pertains to Boilamwini and Gebru's evaluation study of off-the-shelf gender classification algorithms. They, con they conduct an intersectional audit by using finer-grained, i.e. phenotypic versus demographic, tools to evaluate race and ethnicity. And overall, find that the three commercial uh, gender classification algorithms perform worse, worst on the intersectional group, i.e. dark-skinned women. Their findings lead them to recommend diversity in training data, or they're advocating for inclusive benchmark data sets in order to perf improve performance of a classification algorithm. The justification here is that more data and subsequently more data collection equals better, more inclusive outcomes. There are other efforts in computational intersectionality. Kearns et al. aim for error rate parity, and Foulds et al. call for differential fairness metrics for mathematically estimating multidimensionality of protected attributes. Again, here, the lived experience of marginalization in a datafied society is not central. The solution, I would argue, privilege, privileges, again, the designer or developer able to instantiate intersectional awareness. And you could argue as well that in both um, the idea of introducing randomness or inter instantiating intersectional awareness, that such strategies actually benefit the private actors that are developing such systems. A third alternate strategy that has become popular in the wake of big scandals regarding the misuse of data by Facebook pertains to safeguarding competition in the marketplace. The political mainstream in the United States now argues that tech has gotten too big. Finally, tech has gotten too big. In their persuasive critique of a theory of information fiduciaries, Kahn and Posen canvas a set of prescriptive suggestions for curtailing the power of tech companies. So in addition to highlighting antitrust law generally, they also emphasize a variety of mechanisms to address the social costs of surveillance. For example, data interoperability requirements would make it harder for companies to lock in users and benefit from network effects. Likewise, prohibitions against collection and retention of certain types of data, be it sensitive data or otherwise, would reduce or preempt harms due to vast asymmetries that exist between user and company. Stronger liability rules for data breaches and curtailments on modes of earning revenue serve as additional examples that limit the power of companies to force users to trade their data in exchange for access to services provided by companies. Though marginalization might be relatable here, and the image that I use, you can't really see it all that well, but it's Amazon workers uh, protesting against Amazon, uh, Amazon's inhumane and exploitative worker conditions, marginality is nonetheless not central. These arguments, by contrast, stem from a sanguine view of the marketplace and reflect an intrinsic belief in open markets. I have no idea where I am with time, but... So I'm going to skip over the, the um, last three, um, except for to say really quickly, 
with the last two, you might begin to see where marginality might be central to advocating, for example, for anti-discrimination, the use of anti-discrimination anti or human rights law. And the same goes for decentering technology and thinking about other kinds of social policy, such as in the United States, desegregation of schools or procedural reforms, such as tax reform. But on balance, these solutions, this family of alternate governance strategies, are in tension with refusal as a governance strategy. And they're also in tension with one another, right? Instantiating intersectional awareness, introducing heterophily, data literacy. These are potentially at odds with a pushback or with the push for breaking up big technology. And most of these alternative governance strategies do not necessarily need to disclose the lived experience of marginalized people in a datafied society. Breaking up big tech and supporting open markets doesn't necessarily need tech abolition. But nevertheless, they can benefit from a governance strategy that seems both tied to better outcomes and better processes for determining those outcomes. In the words of Nancy Fraser and Elizabeth Anderson, refusal as governance means directly addressing political power, participatory parity, or equal participation. This is the power of refusal. It welcomes friction. It welcomes conflict and discomfort when compared alongside other governance strategies. It can live with contradiction. And it lives with contradiction while still pushing forward a new vision of a just society. It centers people, places, and their histories in a datafied society, not at the expense or in place of more elite decision-making strategies, but to push them to change them, to transform them, to demand what's right and just. Thank you. <laughs>